It was completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him by voice. Now we're going to head across now to Exodus chapter 24. And in between this reading to Exodus 24, God, eh, Moses goes up to the mount with the Lord God and he gives them the Ten Commandments and he, he gives them laws and, and gives them laws that the people have to obey and the commandments and all these different responsibilities for the people. And then we come to Exodus chapter 24 and we're going to read um, from verse 1. And he says, Now he said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the elders of Israel and worship from afar. And Moses alone shall come near the Lord, but they shall not come near, nor shall the people go up with him. So Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which the Lord has said, we will do. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord and he rose early in the morning and he built an altar at the foot of the mountain and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. Then he sent young men of the children of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half the blood and put it in basins and half the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people and said, this is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you according to all these words. Then Moses went up, also Aaron, Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone, and it was like the very heavens in its clarity. But on the nobles of the children of Israel, he did not lay his hands, so they saw God and they ate and drank. Then the Lord said to Moses, come up, come up to me on the mountain and be there, and I will give you tablets of stone and the law and the commandments which I have written, that you may teach them. So Moses arose with his assistant Joshua and Moses, went up to the mountain of God, and he said to the elders, wait here for us until we come back to you. Indeed, Aaron and her are with you. If any man has a difficult difficulty, let him go to them. Then Moses went up into the mountain, and a cloud covered the mountain. Now the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. The sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. So Moses went into the midst of the cloud and went up into the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Turn with me now to Matthew chapter 27. Maybe you're picking up little themes of as I'm reading this. Matthew 27. I just thought about Mount Sinai. And now we're going to think of Mount Calvary. Matthew 27. And we'll, we'll read from 27 as well. Matthew 27 and 27. And it says this, Then the soldiers of the government took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe in him. When they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they spat in him and took the reed and struck him in the head. And when they had mocked him, they took the robe off him, put his own clothes in him and led him away to be crucified. Verse 33, and when they had come to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of the skull, they gave him sour wine mingled with gall to drink. But when he had tasted it, he would not drink. Then they crucified him and divided his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Sitting down, they kept watch over him. Go across to verse 45, please. And the Lord's on the cross now, and it says, Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then we go down to verse 50. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. 
and the earth quaked and the rocks were split and the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. Now across now to Hebrews, please. Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 9. There's so much in Hebrews that I could have read, um, but Hebrews chapter 9, just in relation to what we were reading in Exodus about Moses consecrating the people and the blood being shed and and um, just similar thoughts of what we're going to think on this afternoon. So Romans chapter 9, and we're going, uh, it's Romans, uh, sorry, Hebrews chapter 9, I'm in Romans, that's the problem. Hebrews chapter 9, Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 18. Hebrews 9, 18, it says, Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Then likewise he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no remission. And then Hebrews 10, verse 12, just one verse here. Hebrews 10, verse 12, and it says, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. And then over to verse 19, Hebrews 10 and 19. And this is the last little portion of reading. Okay. And it says, therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Amen. And we'll look to the Lord to, to add a, a blessing and help just as we think about his precious word this afternoon. A lot of reading, um, but as I say, it's it's more important for us to to look at the word of God than, than listen to my voice. Um, as I said at the start, I've been working my way through Exodus and Leviticus, and I've been touching in a few of the epistles and, and into Hebrews. And it's really challenged my heart um, about this full committed um, living of, of consecration. Yeah, Moses and the people and the experience of coming before the Lord God on Mount Sinai. And, and what's really struck me is I've, I've been reading it, and this is the little title that I want to put across what we're going to be talking about um, this afternoon is Sanctif Sanctify Yourselves, Therefore, and Be Ye Holy as I Am Holy. Sanctify Yourselves, Therefore, and be ye holy, for I am holy. You know, when you start reading through Exodus and you come into Leviticus, you can you can start to see the true character of God as he's revealed to the Israelites. Um, we touched on it in our first little part of reading in Exodus 19. God reminded the children of Israel that he'd taken them from, from Egypt. He'd rescued them from the Egyptians and he'd, he'd taken them out from, from the bondage that was there. There was the Passover lamb and we remember the Passover which points to Christ and the blood that was shed and the lamb without blemish and it was taken into the home and they would examine that little lamb for, for four days and then they'd sacrifice and they'd all the pictures of, of the Lord Jesus and then there was the Exodus and we see... God demonstrating his power over the Egyptians and we see God in his fullness and his power and his authority and how God would harden the heart of Pharaoh and then he would harden the heart of Pharaoh again and you see God is sovereign, you see God is a sovereign God and we can learn these different characters and these characteristics of our God and then we see Moses and, and Israel taken and led out of, of bondage of Egypt 
and they go through the Red Sea and the partings and you see this tremendous um, power displayed by God and they come into the wilderness and then we come to these portions of scripture and we see um, God starting to reveal himself to, to Moses in particular. Um, Moses who's chosen by God to, to be the leader of the nation. And what a responsibility that is for Moses is to be this leader over millions, millions of people. Um, and he's to, to be the contact with God. And we see how Moses goes up the mount to meet with God and God descends upon the mount. And what was really sh striking me when I was reading this afresh this year was just the holiness of God. The holiness of God. And I want to, we're going to read on it a little minute, just some of the, the mentions we, we, we read about God's holiness and the way he, he displays himself before the Israelites and, and this, this tremendous scene on Mount Sinai and how it must have, how it must have looked and, you know, the, the effects that was taking place and this, this nation watching these things and how that should have affected their hearts and we learn about that and how it changed them, and how they were to live, and how they were to follow God. And, and we are going to learn a little bit about God's expectation for his people. And we can draw a lines along that with us. The Lord God changes not. The Lord God is the same God, and he is the same God that was in Exodus. He is the same holy, glory, glorious God that's it's in heaven, and he expects the same thing from, from his people. And, you know, I've been reading this, and it's it's been really challenging my heart. Um, just the way that we present ourselves before God and the way that we live our lives and individually and collectively. And and I just thought I'd share it with you for a, a short time um, this afternoon. And we really can learn a lot about God um, through these chapters and we can learn about his holiness. We've spoken about that. That's the eternal theme of God um, is, is his holiness. And we can learn about his glory. We've spoken about glory there in those chapters and we can learn about God and his glory. And a little bit further on, you can learn about God and his glory, the Shekinah glory that would fill the tabernacle, that that portable dwelling place that God would meet with his people and the great high priests and and through all of that, you can look for Christ and and then you can see his appearance. We can learn a little bit about God's appearance. Um, you know, there's little portions there that, you know, that, that met God face to face. And we can learn about his his brightness and we can see God appearing as a fire and, and a, a cloud that would come down and in the midst and thunderings and lightnings and his power and the, the earth, the, the mountain was shaking. And you can learn a bit about God's tremendous power and authority and his appearance. And then we can learn about his order and we can learn about his law and and we can learn about the things that he was giving the people and that they were to obey this law. God was setting out the laws and he was setting out the way that were to offer and they were to meet with God and the, the things that they were to do because they were God's people. So these are all the different things that you can you can learn as you're going through Exodus and Leviticus. And I know there's some young ones here. And I remember when I was younger, I was speaking about it when I was going to like the Sunday schools and the camps and things like that. And I used to maybe try and read my Bible. Whenever I got to like these parts of Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers, you were like, oh, not again. And you would struggle and you'd be reading it. And you're like, what does this actually all mean? Or what has this got to do with, with me today? We're in 2024 now and we're reading about these laws and these offerings and these different, the tabernacle and you're like these furnitures and you'd be reading through bits in your Bible and it'd be like this bit of furniture was to be designed this way and the priest was to wear these garments. And when I was younger, I'd struggle and you would like, what is this actually all meaning and what am I getting out of it? But the more you kind of read it and the more you go to like teaching meetings, people that are better than me teaching it and you start to actually look for the things that you should be looking for. If there's one thing that you should be looking for throughout all of this is Christ. These are all the foreshadows of Christ. So whenever you see something in Exodus or Leviticus and it's something to do with an offering, you look for Christ. So if it's something I mentioned about a blood, you think of Christ and the blood that was shed. Or if you think of something, it mentions something like um, gold that was maybe mentioned, that's deity. And you see the, the, the lamb without blemish, you should think about Christ. Or you think about the fine flower. You think of the Lord who is even and pure and sinless. And you see all these wee pictures and then you can see the tabernacle taking shape, even the colours. 
and you see the blues and the, the purples and the royalty and the heaven and the cherubim which speak of heaven and you can see all of these little things and then you can see the light that was there and it would shine the light in the in the holy place and the bread that was there and you can see all the wee pictures of the Lord Jesus and you can start to write, okay, I can I can understand that and I don't know if you mark your Bible. I've just got a Bible this year. This is the first time I've got a note-taking Bible and I'm actually marking my Bible. And I'd actually recommend it to the younger ones. I don't know, maybe you're ahead of me. Um, but I've got a note-taking Bible and it's been very useful for studying. Just go through a chapter or go through something you can underline in red pen, anything you think's connected to the Lord Jesus. And it's good for your understanding. So through all of this, you're looking for the Lord Jesus. And it's all the foreshadows of, of him who would come. And it's all the pictures of Christ. And it's beautiful, but through it all, you can see God in his holiness, which is a big subject. And you can learn about God and his character, which changes not. And you can see God in his glory and how that should cause us to live our lives day by day. And it's challenged me, and I just want to kind of go into that just now. So let's look at the first little section. I've broke them down into sections to help us go through it. So... We read from Exodus chapter 19, and we read verses 3 to 6, and it says this, And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain. And he says, on verse 5, this is important, but he says, Therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice, it's obedience, keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all the people. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests, and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. So here we have right at the start of this little portion, God's expectation for Moses and for the nation that God's chosen this special nation and he's chosen them for a reason. He's chosen them to be set apart from the other nations. They're God's people. And because they're God's people, they have to be obedient to God. They have to obey his voice. They have to obey his word. They have to keep his covenant. They have to keep his laws, they have to keep his statutes, they have to keep keep his Levitical offerings, they have to keep all of these things. They have to purify themselves, they have to sanctify themselves, they have to be made right for God, because they're God's people. And that's just a little challenge before we go on any further. For you, you know, I'm going to be touching on the new covenant which you've been brought into, but God's God. And if you're here and you're a believer, which you all are, then we should be obeying God's voice, that we should be obeying his word, that we should be living a life that's sanctified. Sanctified means sanctification in your life, a work of the Spirit, cleansing you and purifying you and allowing you to grow and bearing things for God and living your life for God. And this is what God's expecting from his people, that to be set apart from the world. Are we set apart from the world individually? When you're going through your day-to-day, -day, are you living differently? Can people look at you and go, he's different or she's different? Uh, they've got something about them that's different from the way everybody else is living their life. Well, you should because you're, you've got God in your life and you've been saved and you should be living your life in a way that is different from the world because you've got something that the world doesn't have, that you should be rejoicing, that you should be happy, that you should have so much joy that you should have in your life because you're saved and you're secure and you've got a relationship with God. And that's tremendous. That's tremendous. We were thinking about it earlier. That's a tremendous thing that you've been saved. You've been chosen by God. God chose that nation. God chose the nation of Israel. And it was God's ways and he chose them and he brought them out. Just like you've been chosen, you've been brought out of bondage of sin. God chose that nation of Israel and he, the Passover was there and then they were brought out because they were covered with the blood and they were brought out of bondage and they were heading for the promised land. And that's you, that's me. We've been saved, we've been covered with the precious blood of the Lord. You've been brought out of bondage of sin and death and you've been brought into a newness of life. And that should cause you to be rejoicing this afternoon here. You should be, yes, I'm saved and, I, I'm what, and you want because of that. Therefore, because of these things, you want to obey him and you want to live your life for him and you want to be listening to him and you want to be reading the word of God because that's how God communicates to you. And you want to live your life for him and you want to be set apart. But not only that, what else were they? They were to be a holy nation and they were to be priests. And that's an amazing thing as well. The Bible tells us in Peter that you are a priesthood, you know, no longer in the old covenant, but the new covenant that when you're saved, that you've become a priest. 
a priest unto God where you can offer sacrifices of worship and praise. And God wants to hear your praise and your worship and your devotion and your wholeheartedness just pouring out towards God. And that's a good thing to be reminded that when you're going through your day to day and your week to week that you should spend time before him and offer your heart of praise and worship and worship the God who loved you and saved you, redeemed you, brought you into his chosen people and into his kingdom. Tremendous things that you can think about in these little portions of scripture. So that's God's expectation for Israel, but it's God's expectation for us as well to be obedient, to become a, a priest, to serve a holy nation, be set apart, all these little things that we can learn about. And then we have the response. So we have the response of, of Moses. So Moses goes up um, from verses 7 to 15. We learn about Moses' response. He goes up and he comes and he comes back and he goes and he goes and sanctifies the people. He gets them ready. He cleanses the people that have to be washed. You see that there in verse 10. Then the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes. And the people were to go and they were to be washed and they were to be purified and they were to be clean and they were to be ready before they present themselves to God. And that's another wee thing for us as well, our response to God. You know, yes, you've been saved, you've been redeemed, you've been brought out of bondage, you've been brought into a newness of life, and, you know, you can serve God, you're now a priest, or a, and you can offer these sacrifices of praise and worship and aroma that can flow, but can only be done if you're consecrated and you're sanctified and you're washed. You can't be doing these things if you're defiled in any way or if you've got sin on you like the people were to go and wash their clothes it's a, a picture of us being continually washed with the water washed with the word cleansed and purified people are set apart people are holy holy people before a holy God you know God can use you if you're if you're offering yourself with with holy holy hands if you're coming before him and you're you're continually being washed and cleansed and and seeking him to have a relationship with the true and holy God and being in that position and, and in that right place before him. Even this morning when we came in to remember the Lord and into the Lord's Supper and into that environment, you know, it reminds us in, in Corinthians and it tells us how we should be approaching the Lord and how we should be entering into his presence. It's a holy place. You know, did we spend the time this morning before we came in, did, did we get ourselves ready to meet with the Lord? Are we ready to meet and, and feel his presence? You know, when, was, when was the last time, I don't know, maybe Auckland Lake's better than Renfrew or other places, but we actually felt the glory of the Lord amongst us and his presence right there in our midst. If we were all ready and we were really all set apart and we were all offering ourselves and we were all washed with the water and we were all seeking holiness in our lives and we were totally obedient to the word and we were, we were coming in and we could feel the presence of the Lord coming into his presence and feeling the presence of the Lord now that's a, that's a tremendous thing and you can go back into times I'm sure people in this room can think back and you can remember when you've been in a meeting you think the spirit of God was there or you can come into a, a revival meetings or you can think back to when people were being saved or you can think, oh, that meeting was powerful. The presence of the Lord was there. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real thing. I think we've maybe moved away from that a wee bit and think, you know, this, this just happens every so often, but why should it happen every so often? If we were a people who were a chosen priesthood and set apart and were holy and were continually pouring out all that we have before the Lord and we were crying out to him to just fill us with the presence, the glory in this place and just, you could feel the Lord. These things have been going on in my mind. So we have the, the response from the people and that should be our response to God who saved us. We want to live our life for him. We want to empty ourselves of everything that we've got and fill ourselves with the Lord Jesus and fill ourselves with the spirit of God and offer ourselves before him. And then I want to really think about God in the Mount because this is the bits that actually got me a little bit scared, a wee bit fear when you think, you know, sometimes you can go through, not the motions, but you can just go through reading or praying and you just, just becomes maybe just 
part of your routine that you're just, I'll pray in the morning and then I'll spend a wee bit of time in the Word. And these are good things. And maybe I'll just go away and I'll, I'll go to this meeting, I'll go to that meeting and I'll pray now. And But then I was thinking when I was reading this through and it really struck me to think about God on the Mount and to think about the holiness of God in this Mount. And we're going to look at it in Hebrews, which we read, because this is a tremendous, tremendous thing that we're going to think about. And it it's, it blows my mind when I think about what we've been brought into. But when you see God here displayed on the mount, and we can see how the mounting, it says there in verse 16, look at verse 16, it came to pass on the third day in the morning, there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain. And the sound of the trumpet was so loud, and that's not somebody blowing a trumpet, that's a heavenly trumpet sounding. And there's this thunderings and there's these lightnings and you can just imagine the, the nation of Israel looking at the Mount, Mount Sinai, a mountain on this world, and you can see what's before them that's coming from heaven and you can see the Lord's presence before them and they're hearing this heavenly trumpet and they're seeing these thunderings and they're seeing these lightnings and they're seeing the cloud come down in the mount and it says there, what does it say? That the people who were in the camp trembled, trembled before God. Tremble before his awesomeness and tremble before his righteousness and tremble before his holiness. And I was I was thinking when I was reading these things, I was like, when was the last time I trembled before the Lord? Personally, is it should I be trembling before him? Should I have that might that image in my mind more often of thinking of God and, and heaven? You can go to Ezekiel chapter one or Isaiah chapter six or go into Revelation and, and you get a sense of the throne of heaven and you get a sense of the glory of God and you see the beasts that are bound down. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who is and is to come continually. Holy, holy, holy. And you see the Lord here in the mount and you see the tremblings and the lightnings and the trumpet sounding and the people falling down before God. Should that be our heart? Have we lost this sense of who God truly is? And all his power and all his glory and all his holiness. Have the people of God just got a little bit missing the mark? Should we be coming before him, trembling before him and his holiness? Reverently adoring him, praising him. Oh, if we just got a little glimpse of his glory. A little droplet of his glory, how would it change our lives? How would we be living our lives if we could just see a little glimpse of all the glory of heaven? It's been my prayer that the Lord would just allow that just to permeate into my mind, just to understand him just a little bit more. Just to understand who he is. In all his fullness, my mind will never be able to comprehend it, but just allow it just to come out of the word of God as you read these portions of scripture. Read Exodus, read the Mount, Mount Sinai and the thunderings, and you go into Ezekiel 1, go into Isaiah 6, go into Revelation, you see the Lord, you see the throne room of heaven, you see the glory that is there. It's tremendous. And the people of God should be trembling, we should be on our faces before him, we should be crying out to him, to fill these places, to fill our nation with that glory, for people's hearts to be responding to him, for the God's chosen people's hearts to be responding, it has to happen with us. It has to start with us. Our hearts just a little bit too hard. Does the Spirit of God need to come in and just soften us, soften us, soften us down again? Let the word just come out fresh again. Just get a little glimpse of who God is again and just cause us just to fall down before him. Fall down before him and just worship him. Worship him. Adore him. What a change it would be. Worshipping the Lord. Worshipping the Lord. And you see the tremendous glory on the mountain. You see the people falling down and they're consecrated before them. You see God responding and you see Moses going up the mountain. You see the fellowship that's about to be had. And then we go over to 24. This is the important bit when you talk about the doctrines and you see these things. And this is important for the young people when you're thinking about these portions of scripture. You think about here the blood. And um, we see this is all consecrated by blood. It's all consecrated by the blood that was shed. And in Exodus 24, we see 
what Moses was to do. Moses, he went and he rose early in the morning and he built the altar and we see the worship Moses was prepared. He's up early in the morning and he's building these altars and there's the 12 pillars that represent each tribe of the nation. The whole nation's there before the mount and Moses is there and he's he's interceding for the people. And then he goes and he, he gets the, the oxen and he has these sacrifices, the burnt offerings and the peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And then he takes the blood and what does he do? He puts them in the basins. He has this these bloods in the basins and he goes and he, he pours half of it on the onto the altar and then he takes the book of the covenant and he reads it before the people. And the people all hear it. And what do they say? They say, all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient, verse 7. So that's them saying, we have heard what you're saying and we will obey that voice. And then Moses takes the blood and he sprinkles it on the people. There as he sprinkles the blood on all the people and the blood shed upon the people and the blood shed upon the altars. And you're seeing pictures of Christ and you're seeing Moses and the people are being set apart and they're being consecrated and they're being set for God. This holy chosen kingdom of people, this priesthood have been set and they're there and they're sprinkled with the blood and they're chosen. And then we see what goes on after it up the mount. And you know, the covenant here is marked by blood and blood is so important. And you could take that portion of scripture and you could put a little bracket around it. You could just say Christ and underline it because we're going to go to it in a little minute. And then we see there the, the covenant that was made with the people is consecrated by the sprinkling of the blood. It's important. It's important. And the covenant there was made and the offerings were made and the sacrifices was made and it was put on these 12 pillars and on the altars and they were all marked. The whole nation was covered with the blood and then the people were covered in the blood and they all said with their mouths, mouths that they will be their people and will obey what the Lord has said and that's it set and the covenant set, the old covenant is set with the people and the Lord and Moses and it's all bound there together. It's bound with the blood and it foreshadows the, of the Lord Jesus Christ and we're going to turn to it in a little second but before we do, I just want to look at this, this portion of scripture on the mount with God and Moses and they go up Aaron, Nadab, Abihu and the 70 elders and they go up and they see God and there was under his feet a paved work of sapphire and it was like the very heavens in clarity now it's beautiful and they go up and then it goes down verse 17 the sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire there's one of the pictures of the Lord it was like a consuming fire upon the mount So Moses went into the midst of the cloud and went up on the mountain and see this consuming fire. And we've, we've thought about the pictures and the scene on top of Mount Sinai. It's just a wee side note just before I go on. I was actually watching a docu documentary with my grandfather and um, it was about this little portion. It was actually a wee while ago and they say you can actually still go up Mount Sinai and for whatever reason, well, we know the reason, but there's actually marks upon the top of Mount Sinai where there would have been a consuming fire. And it could only have been if God's presence was there. So it was actually backing up the actual fact of this portion of scripture. And on Mount Sinai today, there is actually like burnt marks upon big rock faces and things like that. And and it was a, it was an Israel. It was a Jewish type thing. And they were talking about Moses, and they were talking about the Red Sea parting and these things. But they went to that point, and they were talking about Mount Sinai to this day still has the marks of where God was like a consuming fire on this world. It's incredible. Just a wee side thought. I thought I'd just put that in there. And we see this, this consuming fire on top of the mountain. And we see God on the mountain. Now, I want to just keep those things in your mind. Think about what we've just spoken about with God and his holiness and his splendor and his majesty and his glory and the, the fire and the thunderings and the trumpet sounds and the people trembling before God. And now we're going to turn to Matthew chapter 24, uh, 27. And we looked at God on the mount. And we're going to look at God on the mount again. But this time, it's the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God on the mount. And we read those verses. And this is the cost for for myself and for you that are here today and people that are online. You know, back in the Old Testament, in that Old Covenant, the people were to sprinkle the blood on the altars and they were to sprinkle the people with the blood. But 
you know, that was just a foreshadow of something that was yet to take place. And, and God was pleased with that and the covenant was set. But now we fast forward thousands of years and we come into this scene and we're going back now 2,000 years to our date and we come to God that was in the flesh upon this world. And the cost for us to be here, redeemed, chosen, accepted in the beloved, knowing these things and understanding our God and everything that we've already said, but for us to be in this position, what did it cost? It cost the Son of God. It cost him to be humbled into a man's body, to be humbled before these Roman sh soldiers. And it tells us the horrible things that they've done to God. This is the Son of God. This is the God that's equal with God on the Mount, Mount Sinai. He's the one that is totally in balance with him. He's totally balanced, sorry, with him. And he's all power and authority. And it's the same God. And he's here and he's before these men, these Roman soldiers. And what are they doing to the eternal Son of God? For our sake, they're spitting in his face. They're spitting in his face and they're slapping him and they're mocking him and they're whipping him and they're beating him and they're putting a crown of thorns in his head and they lead him out like a criminal and a thief and they take him away and they lead him outside the city and they put him up onto another mountain. This time it's not Mount Sinai with the thunderings and the lightnings and the consuming fire that we've seen there, but we're coming up to Mount Calvary, Golgotha's Hill. And what does it tell us? They nail the Son of God upon a cross. Your Saviour. Your Saviour. My Saviour. They nail him to a cross and what do they do? They raise him up like a common thief. Tells us that the world plunged into darkness. Darkness. And it tells us that the world shook. Earthquake shook as the maker hung upon a cross. The veil of the temple was rent. Contrast from Mount Sinai to Mount Calvary. We see the people trembling before God and his holiness and fearing him. And here we have people with the audacity to slap the Son of God and to put him on a tree and to crucify him. Brothers and sisters, it was the only way that we would be here today. It was set in eternity past that our Saviour would hang in a tree. The one who had all that glory in the place of eternity past, the one who had complete balance in the warmth and the beauty of the Godhead, would one day be found in a cross, hanging there suffocating for my sin and for your sin. What a saviour. I just wanted to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. I just wanted to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ for what he endured for our salvation. It's a tremendous thing. It's a tremendous thing that the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, would hang in a tree upon a mount for our sin. Oh, the cost. Oh, the cost. For us to simply turn and put our faith in him and to be saved. How wonderful the gospel is. How wonderful it is for us to be here. How wonderful it should be for us to say that we're saved. How wonderful it is for us to serve the true and living God by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was the fulfillment of all the foreshadowing. And now let's turn to Hebrews. Just conscious of time. Hebrews chapter 9. And here we have the little bit of fulfillment and we can learn about that in Hebrews and Hebrews you could just write over it it is finished completed the work is done and when you want to learn about all the fulfillment of the Old Testament and all these things turn to the book of Hebrews and Christ is exalted he's the one who's superior than all of these things the one who's greater than all of these things and if you want to learn about the fullness of Christ and the fullness of that sacrifice and and the acceptability of it by God the Father then read Hebrews and your mind can be taken up with him and you can be lost in outpouring of love for him as you go through all of these things and you can learn about your Saviour and how great he is and you can really get in about it and you can really understand him and what it cost him for us to be saved. And then we read here in verse, what's that? Hebrews 9 verse 19, 18 to 22. We learn there the fulfillment of what we spoke about in Exodus and we see 
Moses who took the blood and he sprinkled it. And then we see the Lord Jesus, we read that in um, Hebrews 10, verse 12. But this man, after he'd offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. And we see the fulfillment of what was in the Old Testament. You see the Lord Jesus, who was the fulfillment of that blood being shed, the sprinkling of the blood. We see the picture being fulfilled. We see the Lord Jesus who has offered himself once and you see throughout the Old Testament all the Levitical offerings, it was the continual work, the continual offerings, the continual burnt offerings, the continual work of the priest, the continual work of the great high priest. It was always working service, service. It was offerings had to be made, offerings had to be made, offerings had for the sin of the people, for the sin of the people. But this man, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice, one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, fulfilled, finished. It's a beautiful thing, you know, when you think about the tabernacle and you think about the service of, of the priests that would go into the holy place and the table of showbread and the candlestick and the incense that would flow and then there would be the veil and they would go through the veil of the cherubim, the great high priest and the day of atonement. And you'd have the mercy seat and the cherubim and they would go in and they would sprinkle the blood and they would have their garments on, holiness as the Lord and the mitre on their head. And they'd go in and they'd have bells on them. They'd have the bells and the tunics because they'd have, have to go into the Shekinah glory of the Lord. And they would have bells on them so that people could hear and say, are they still alive in the presence of the Lord before the Shekinah glory? And they'd go in and they'd sprinkle the blood. But here we have no seat found in there. No seat found in the holies of holies and no seat found in the holy place. But here we have the Lord Jesus after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down, finished, rest, a place of reward, complete. Beautiful picture there of the Lord Jesus in his fullness, fulfilling all that was in that tabernacle, fulfilling all that was in the temple place, fulfilling all of those sacrifices, fulfilling the law, fulfilling everything that the Lord had given them, the Lord sat down. Isn't it amazing to be here, resting, resting, secure in that finished work. A saviour who is ascended and is seated at the right hand of the glory of God. Isn't that incredible to think that's where he is? That's his office. That's where he's sit sitting for us. Now, I just want to touch on this just before we finish, and it's just entering into the presence. And this is the little bit that I just wanted to touch on um, in Hebrews 10. And this, this is the bit that, it was incredible to me. And as we thought about the people trembling before the Lord and Mount Sinai and the glory, the holiness and all the things that were displayed there that were spoken about. And even as the great high priests and the priests would go in to serve in the tabernacle and the temple and the Shekinah glory and the way they were to present themselves, you know, if there was anything done that didn't please the Lord that was often dealt with with judgment and death, the Lord was a just God and had his ways and his laws and precepts and they're all there and they were to be obeyed. And we come into this new covenant, that veil that was rent from top to bottom, finished work, the whosoever, now not just for the Jew in Israel, but the whosoever, the Jew, the Greek, the Gentile, can all can come into the goodness of the fullness of that sacrifice, the whosoever can be preached, the whosoever shall put their trust in the Lord, the whosoever can turn and can be saved, and they can all come into this newness, this new covenant by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And here we have this incredible portion of scripture. And it's the word boldness that really, I just struggle to comprehend when I think about myself. And for me here, this is the word that struggles. And it says this, therefore, brethren, this is, Hebrews 10 and 19, it says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh and having a high priest over the house of God. It says, that's, a, that's an incredible portion of scripture that tells us that we can enter we can enter, people in here, those who have been saved, can enter into the presence of the holiest. We can enter into the presence of the holiest of God before his throne. And we're so thankful that it's not because of us. 
so thankful it's not because of what we can bring or what we can do because we would be nowhere. But why can we enter into the holiest? By the blood of Jesus. By the blood of Jesus and we can enter into the presence of the holiest. And I want us just to think about that and I want us just to refresh that into our minds about the value of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and the value of your salvation and how incredible it is that you've been saved. It's incredible that you've been chosen by God and you've been redeemed by the precious blood of the Lamb. That you've been through that sacrifice and now you're able, because of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, to enter right into the, the holiest before the Almighty God, before his throne. It's, it's incredible with this new and living way. Something that the, the Israel, Israelites and the Jews would never be able to think about entering into the, the holiest place. We just mentioned about the, the great high priest who went with the bells and the Shekinah glory. But we're able, by faith, to enter right into that holiest place before the throne of God by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, the blood of the Lord. How precious. The value. That redeeming blood. That blood that has reconciled us back to God. It's an, it's an incredible portion of scripture. And it says, he consecrated for us. That is his flesh. And we have a great high priest over the house of God. And then these little verses I'm just going to leave with you. And it says this, let us draw near. So this is us drawing now before the Lord. Let us draw near with what? A true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. That's how we have to approach our God. That's how we have to draw near his presence. Full assurance. You know, if you haven't had the full assurance or maybe you've had little doubts and I just want to say, take what you've heard today, take the Bible, take what you've that God's put in before you, that the full assurance of the Lord Jesus Christ, the full assurance and the value of the blood that was shed at Calvary. Yes, it was over 2,000 years ago, but it's still valuable and it's still saving souls and praise be to God that souls are still being saved by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. His son, and you're here today and you've been saved because of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Have full assurance and faith in that as you draw an eye. It's because of him and because of that blood and because of what he done for you at Calvary. And it says, what does it say? Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with the pure water. Are we clean before we draw an eye unto God? Is our mind pure? Are we, are we washed? Are we ready? Have, have we got the evil consciences away? Have we got the thoughts out of our minds that aren't there, that shouldn't be there? Are we, are we draw an eye unto God? Are, are we just turning up before God in any old manner? Are we just dropping down into prayer where things are still going on in our mind? Or how are we drawing an eye to God? How are we drawing an eye to a holy God? Yes, we've been saved. Yes, we've been redeemed. Yes, we can enter through that new and living way by the blood of the Lord. But you've still got a part to play. You've still got the bit of clearing the mind and being washed and being sanctified and being ready to meet with God. I know I say it again, and you know, are we trembling before him? It's good to be be lost in the word at these moments where you really get to understand God and His and the revelation of his glory, it should cause our hearts to tremble. You know, the Bible tells us what's, what's the beginning of wisdom, the fear of the Lord. We should be fearing his holiness and his greatness and his authority. Wouldn't it be great if everyone in this room just got a little touch of that and a little drop of the glory of God? the value of the Lord and we just refresh our minds again this afternoon of what it cost him for us to be saved and enter into redemption for us to be able to boldly enter into the holiest and let us just draw nigh unto him and cleanse our minds with a true heart of faith and to be washed in the water washed in the word holding fast our confession of our hope without wavering. Let's not waver. Let's be a steadfast people. Steadfast, fixing our minds upon eternity, looking for the soon return of our Saviour. Oh, what a hope we've got. 
what a joy they should have. Fixing our minds, fixing, not wavering, fixing steadfastly upon our home. To enter into that place that we've just, we can't even think about, entering into the fullness of the glory of heaven. To one day being able to look at our Saviour's face, what day that will be when we see him. We see him, our Lord Jesus Christ, fall down before him and we'll see the great throne room of heaven and we'll be able to see the glory of God. And we'll have that fellowship we read about in the Exodus there when Moses went up the mount. And he went up the mount and he broke bread and ate in the presence of God. And there was this beautiful fellowship with God. You know, we've got a fellowship with God. We can come and we can meet and we can remember and we can have fellowship. But what a fellowship it will be when we go into enter into the glory. And then we'll see the fullness of heaven. And we'll see the one who hung on a cross for us. And you'll see the marks of Calvary upon him. I don't even think we'll be able to look at him because his glory will shine out like a radiant light. And I think all we'll be able to do is fall down and what we'll do, we'll tremble before him. We'll tremble before him. My prayer for my heart is that I would tremble before him more day by day. Be found low, emptying myself and asking the Lord just to allow me just to have a droplet of the glory in my mind. Oh, how that would change us. How it would change us individually. How it would change our same. How would it change the pouring out of the gospel? How it would change our nation if we had people that were ready, trembling before God and seeking God and waiting and watching for God and their whole lives were just saturated with God and with prayer and with worship? Oh, let that be our hearts this afternoon. Thanks for listening. I know I can diverge and ping off different tangents but let's just pray and let us just ask for God's help for, for each of us and 